Everybody wave and say hello. I gotta get a picture of this. Be happy. All right, that will be on Twitter. <laughs> All right, thanks everybody. Um, my name is Chris Walker, and uh, I, by happenstance, built an Xbox app um, over the summer. Uh, there's my Twitter handle, so you can follow me there and pick up that picture of yourselves in the audience. A uh, little bit of context. Um, I like to hike, backpack, and climb mountains. Um, it's, uh, I climb mountains, mostly big ones, in the wintertime. It's kind of a self-masochistic kind of thing. Um, I live in a little town called Saratoga Springs in upstate New York. Google Maps doesn't do a very good representation about exactly where that is, but um, it's not New York City. Uh, I work for a company called Mad Glory Interactive, which is also in Saratoga. And uh, believe it or not, there's actually a handful of really innovative little software companies in our town um, that we're pretty proud of, uh, and we're, we're glad to be a part of that community there. Um, we're a consulting engineering and creative agency. Um, we spend about 80% of our time playing games, or um, building games. Um, no, we do, we do everything except actually work on the games. We work on uh, online scoring systems, uh, community development sites, um, and uh, a couple of really big games we're privileged to be a part of. Um, we also do a little bit of work for um, some Fortune 500 type companies. Um, and uh, we get to do some really cool stuff with them too. Um, so basically, we get to build cool things without assuming any of the risk of owning any of these products. <laughs> um, so it's a great position to be in. Um, we try to be technology agnostic um, with some success. Uh, we do use Backbone a lot, um, and it uh, seems to be our go-to framework. We also maintain um, the Backbone Fetch Cache plugin. Um, so if you have any tomatoes left and you're not happy with Fetch Cache, you can throw them now. Um, and if you're not happy with Fetch Cache, go to the GitHub page. Put in an issue. Um, if you haven't checked it out, check it out. Uh, you, you very high likelihood you find a use for it in the future. Um, anyway, this summer we got invited to build an Xbox One application. Um, and a lot of people don't know, um, and a lot of people do know, um, and perhaps you let it escape your mind, that Microsoft came up with this idea called Metro, um, which is you could use HTML5 in JavaScript to build applications on a phone. Um, on a laptop, computer, um, and on an Xbox. Um, and it's, it's not worked out that great. Um, nonetheless, this is the best way to get an application onto an Xbox. Um, so we did play around a little bit with um, some Windows applications um, just to kind of get our feet wet and do some experimentation. We had to do a lot of R&D, um, like Henrik was talking about earlier today. We did that on both the Windows and Xbox. Um, in the end, we made the decision to go back to Backbone, um, despite the fact that there is a lot, um, a lot of infrastructure that Microsoft has put together for building applications on these platforms. Um, we made that decision, uh, as it turned out to be a good one. Um, however, nonetheless, we still got beat up. Um, one of my coworkers is saying, it feels like every time we release this app to Microsoft, it feels like we just got beat up in gym class. Um, you know, it should be, you know, it should be like popping corks and champagne being happy, but um, it's Microsoft, so. Uh, so anyway, I think despite the fact this is a gaming console, um, we all don't use them and we certainly all don't develop software on them. We learned a lot, um, and so I think, I hope everyone will get a lot out of this talk. Um, so this is what the app looks like. Um, it is uh, what we call a matchmaking app, uh, which is basically what you think. It's a dating app for game players. So you get to find people online who are interested in similar things in, to you and play games. You can see the, the target market for this app is going to be, uh, I don't know, 18 to 30-year-old males. Um, so that seems to be what people like Gatorade and Monster want to sell products to. Um, so anyway, the, the, we don't know what the revenue will be um, for this particular app yet, but the client came to us. Um, it looked really exciting, and, and we took it on. Um, so just to give you kind of an idea how it works, uh, I'll do a quick demo. I don't actually have an Xbox, but I do have a recording. So here we go. So it's called Overdog, by the way. Oop. What 
what I need to do is just get QuickTime smaller, pull it up to that screen, and then make it big, and then play. All right, thanks for saying something. That would have been really embarrassing if I just sat here and told you what it was and didn't have nothing to look at. So the idea here is the player would go in, um, they would pick various topics that would be interested in. Um, that's their profile uh, screen right there. And this person is kind of browsing around, looking at the current topics they have pinned to their profile. Uh, and then you have this other selection of featured topics and things like that, things that you can be interested in. Um, and then we use a server-side algorithm to kind of figure out um, what kind of people you'd like to play against. Uh, you use a, a menu there to, to pin topics to your profile, and then you see the backbone view will update itself. One thing to keep in mind is all this is happening. Like This is backbone. This is backbone on a gaming console. Uh, each topic has a detail page. Um, usually involves uh, a nice background image like that. Uh, and then from that detail page, you can also like and unlike a topic. I'll let that go for just about two more seconds, and then I think we get the idea. Um, so there's a lot of CSS animations going on here, um, JavaScript animations as well as when we can't use CSS. There we go. Cool. So that's it. Talk. Um, no, I'm sure you want to know more than than just watching some pretty things on the screen. Um, so this is basically how the whole thing comes together. Um, we need to interface with something called Xbox Live. That's how Microsoft manages the user profiles. Um, so pretty much any time a user steps in front of their Xbox, they can and should be signed in. Um, and Microsoft wants their apps that are on that console to use that user profile. So there's basically a single sign-on experience and that, that's a requirement. Like you cannot release an app into the Xbox environment without using that. So we need to interface very heavily with Xbox Live. Um, it is a RESTful service. Uh, however, it's a huge, huge pain to use with HTTP. Um, but Microsoft has uh, lovingly bound that up into some C++ bindings, which then get exposed to JavaScript, um, which work as advertised 50% of the time. So, uh, so we have to interface with Xbox Live. Um, we also need to get content on there. So there's kind of this mishmash of content management tools we could possibly use. Um, none of them really fit the bill, um, but I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and then we needed to build like our own, our own services. So that service decides like what kind of players could possibly want to play with each other. Um, like what topics should be being served to a particular console. And every time someone opens a topic, it shows like all the related topics. So if you're interested in this topic, you obviously must be really interested in these other topics. Um, we all know how that works, thanks to Amazon. Um, Xbox Live. Uh, yeah, this slide is blank because there's not much I can tell you about it because Microsoft doesn't want us to, um, other than it's really hard to use and um, you don't ever want to have to interface with that. So, oh. um, the, the, our, the service that we built, um, so this is just kind of give you a little background and information on why back, Backbone kind of fits here. Um, and as I tell you about it, I think you'll kind of put the pieces together and figure it out. So um, we have all these topics, uh, and then we have to relate them to users. We decided to do that with a Node um, service built with Action Hero. Um, we actually have two servers. Um, one is the server that serves player profiles uh, and then matches players up. And then we have a socket IO server, um, which is also runs on Node. And we have socket IO running on the Xbox as well, by the way, um, which was kind of interesting. We did a couple experiments and it worked. We were not. So um, we're using sockets um, when players actually match up with each other. We're using sockets to send a notification from one household to another household and being, hey, this person wants to play with you. Are they interested? Okay, you can be friends and you can play now, you can play later, or maybe you want to get into a party together and chat about it. Um, that's all done with Socket.io. Um, the really, really hard piece was figuring out how we're going to do content management. Um, we couldn't find any CMS that was really going to 
do what we wanted to do. Like we have all these topics and all this artwork we need to get into onto the console. It's all kind of structured. Um, you know, it's all structured data. And how are we going to do that? Um, so we ended up building something. Um, kind of jokingly called it Calamari. Uh, but the name stuck. Um, and it's since become a product. Um, the way it works is that we have um, a user interface, which incidentally is built with Backbone and Marionette. Um, it's a Rails application, and it allows a designer to kind of put data into the system. Oops, I need to go back to one. Jumped ahead too far. So um, it allows someone who is not who is not a programmer really to put to put uh, artwork and content into the system. Um, it stores it into a a Rails application, uh, and then just simply serves JSON back to the client, right? And so. That's where like Backbone makes complete and total sense. So we're taking all the structured data, we're making models and collections out of it, um, and then the actual artwork um, that you see displayed on the Xbox is being served off of a CDN. Um, we're also doing some lazy loading, uh, which you'll see in a little while, and it was really cool to see how that's being done to map out um, water pipes. Um, so yeah, more more good stuff. Um, all right, so. There's the animation, <laughs> so you can see how our content management system works. Um, so now we're ready to go. We've got all this awesome architecture we've designed, perfect, what could possibly go wrong? We're gonna build this amazingly piece of equipment. Um, however, there's a couple more things we gotta add into the mix. Uh, there's this thing called WinJS. Um, uh, some of you may have heard of it. So it's, it's basically the library that you're supposed to use to build Xbox apps and Windows phone apps and Windows 8 apps. Um, it has actually some really cool stuff in it. Um, we have to use, we have to use it because we don't have a choice, basically. Um, we would have had to re-implement all those nice little tiled widgets and things like that. Um, we would have to re-implement all those as like web components, for example, um, which would have been a really fun experiment, but we just didn't have the time. Um, so all that stuff comes out of the box with WinJS, uh, so that's what we ended up using. Um, they also have some other things we needed to use. Um, they have promises, and we love promises, don't get me wrong, but um, their promises are broken, <laughs> badly broken. The problem is, is that lovely Xbox Live API returns broken promises, which of course don't work with any of the promises that work right. Um, doesn't work with jQuery deferreds, it doesn't work with um, yeah, name your like spec conforming promise library that you like and it doesn't work with it. Um, so basically if we're going to use promises they got to spread through, throughout the whole app um, and we have no choice but to use the ones that WinJS provides for us. Um, so that was fun. Uh, so we, we chose to use Backbone um, for a number of reasons despite the fact that we still had to use WinJS. Um, we're all familiar with Backbone, so it's kind of a common language, um, where WinJS is very arcane, um, and it was gonna be a long ramp up time just to get used to that. Um, there's more support, like if you Google for things on WinJS, you're probably not gonna find much of anything. Um, you Google for questions on Backbone and Stack Overflow and everything else, um, we all know that story. Um, and then lastly, the way that WinJS encourages you to structure your applications didn't really make a whole lot of sense. Um, and the example applications that Microsoft gave to us were really, really monolithic and horribly organized. Um, they were thinking, no way, uh, back to MVC. Um, we did take some things from WinJS, as I mentioned. Um, so the widgets, the, um, we used probably 90% of them. Um, promises, uh, again, too bad. Um, it's good that they have them, but they don't work. Um, the routing and page controls, uh, we had to use those again because we didn't have a choice. Um, to re-implement the way that they do that would have taken um, forever. But basically, it works the same, basic same concept as Backbone. Um, but it's, they kind of like swap, they take your entire DOM and they rip it out from underneath you and they like swap in a whole other DOM. And like the, both of them are on the screen at the same time while it's animating between the two and it really messes everything up. But nonetheless, that's the way it goes. Um, but they do have a really nice application initialization process. They give you an application object very similar to, to what we would get with Marionette. Um, 
from Backbone, the usual suspects. We use the models and collections of views. Um, we use jQuery, we use underscore, and we also use Marionette. Um, bits and parts of Marionette. That global application object, which has uh, a really nice event bus system on it, um, we use that, um, and we, lay, we use the layouts and regions to manage the view state control. So when a view gets destroyed, you gotta clean it up because you don't want zombies hanging around and all that kind of stuff. Marionette really helps out a lot with that. So now we're ready. Now we're ready to go. Um, but again, <laughs> we crash into this thing. Um, it looks beautiful. Uh, it's really cool to play with, um, but it's arcane. No one knows anything about this thing. No one in Microsoft knows how this thing works. I swear. <laughs> Nobody can help you. Nobody. Nobody can help you. You can't, you can't Google about this because of the NDA things. You talk to people at Microsoft and they pass you around to their engineering department. Um, so instead of building this, we end up building something <laughs> a little more like that. It works. <laughs> you know what, but, but in the end, um, arcane platforms require a lot of guesswork, um, and they require a lot of hacks. And when you're innovating, it's not pretty, but you gotta find things that get the job done. Um, and no matter how much we hate it, um, ugly code doesn't really matter. None of the problems that we had to solve resulted from an unsightly or un, unrecognizable code base. Um, we had a lot of weird stuff going on in here. Um, however, something that we always try to remind ourselves is that customers buy products. They don't see the code, they don't know how it works, and they really don't care. Um, they really don't care that you have three different libraries on here, nothing works the way that you're used to it working. Um, they have a nice product in their hands that they can use. Um, that said, let's get into some code. All right, so uh, WinJS, what I didn't mention, they have this really nice namespacing thing. Um, so you can create a global namespace and manage that. Um, these are objects created the way objects should be created according to Douglas Crockford, um, where it just kind of creates these um, like namespace objects that can't really be mutated, uh, which is really great. Uh, we have some global variables that we've closed over top of, and basically it allows us to do that line at the bottom. Um, we, get to, we get to have those globals exposed, and uh, they're immutable, so you know, your buddy sitting next to you who's also programming on the same thing can't screw them up. Um, and vice versa, more vice versa probably. Um, and then we use the Marionette application object. Um, so we throw another global into the space, um, basically, we do this inside of another closure, um, and we create that, uh, that application object. Again, we use this mainly for the event bus, um, which is super, super handy. Um, so make sure you look up the links from James' talk yesterday in the, the Marionette talk, um, and take a look at the Marionette event bus. Even if you're not going to use Marionette, um, the event bus can be super helpful. Um, so we return a global application, which we just call our backbone app. Um, and the BA thing is just shorthand, so we can use that in the debugging console, because typing out backbone app the whole time um, isn't cool. Oh yeah, the console doesn't have tab complete, that's why. So, BA. Um, second, and more importantly, we need some base classes. Um, the reason we want to do this right away is that when you get later on into your project, um, you find a lot of cases, um, at least we do anyway, where you want to you wanna change all of, all of your class instances all at once, um, and you're like, man, if we had just inherited from one object, we'd be able to do this in one place, and now we have to like, change 50 different files to do this. So right in the very beginning, we start creating these base classes. Um, these ones are for entities, so even though we have no code to go in there, um, we have models and collections. Um, we're not really extending anything except all of our other collections and models are going to extend from these base classes. We do the same thing. Um, those are views. Uh, so we do the same thing with views. So those are, those are the four 
Yes, those are the four view types um, that Marionette is now going to reduce down to two, from what I understand. So that would be fantastic. Um, but to get around some of those DOM issues that I mentioned before, um, you get into some really ugly hacks. So basically, all of our regions have to inherit from this thing. Um, that get element um, method does something very different in actual Marionette than what we needed it to do on the Xbox. Um, and I won't get into the details there, um, but just have a look at that last line of code, uh, which is, uh, so effectively we're doing this. We're using an attribute selector to find an element with an ID. How wrong is that? <laughs> but believe it or not, when the, when the Xbox swaps in those two DOMs, those two elements with the same ID will exist on that page for a brief period of time. And when you select by ID, you'll get the first one. When you, what you really want is the second one. Um, and we can't change that ID. That ID is identified by the system as being like the container for the page. Um, and we needed to use that for our, our marionette regions. Um, so yeah, so I spent a whole day selecting an element by its ID and getting two of them. Uh, <laughs> a whole day. <laughs> Um, so here's where we use our base classes. So in other modules, um, in other mo uh, a typical module exists of um, a model, a collection, um, and then at least one view, if, if, if probably more. Um, and then those, those components inherit from those base classes that we've already created. Um, and that's where that comes into play. Since we've inherited from our own and not from Marionette or Backbone, then we can make um, global changes to all of our classes without having to mess around with backbone or marionette code. Um, and that's obviously what you want to be doing. Um, also, don't be afraid to create custom objects. We have a lot of these. We have what we, what we call data service layer, which I'll get into later. But um, not every object needs to be a model collection view or controller. Uh, marionette has this really nice object you can create, you can create other classes from, you can inherit from. It's called uh, marionette.object, interestingly enough. Um, but it gives you, it gives you events, um, and it gives you event cleanup and a couple other really useful things. So when we would build these service classes, we would inherit from marionette.object. Um, this particular one is instantiates the socket IO service. Um, and then, yeah, we like promises. Um, despite the fact this particular implementation was broken, um, it did it still makes a lot of sense um, from our point of view. Uh, the first step in that is to return a promise from backbone.ajax. Um, as you'll see later, we don't use backbone Ajax as you typically would. So in other words, um, model.sync or collection.sync doesn't call backbone Ajax. Um, we actually call it from our data service layer. It's just a wrapper around the HTTP mechanism on the Xbox. Um, which does implement um, XHR. So instead of returning a jQuery deferred here, we return a WinJS promise because the jQuery deferred doesn't work with uh, the WinJS promises. So we need to convert it and, and return one of those, which really isn't that difficult. That wasn't bad, um, a good thing to do. Um, so now getting into our data service layer. So here's the concept. We have this data service layer and that knows where to get data, it knows how to cache it, and it also knows a good place for impl implementing mocks, mock, mock data for testing, and also um, where to stash offline data. So that's where all that logic is. Um, and I think it's kind of similar to what Tim was talking about yesterday with his backbone.session object. Um, it's just like we need one place where all this interaction kind of happens. We need, to, we need to interact with that CMS service, we need to interact with our own um, matchmaking service and we need to interact with Xbox Live and all of them work very very differently so we kind of need, need this data service layer which gets all this data pulls it in as JSON or, or JavaScript objects or whatever um, and then instantiates the collections or models from there so once these collections are out they just kind of float around freely um, and they're not they're not mapped to any RESTful API they're not mapped to an endpoint period um, they're just collections floating around in space and the user interface can call for them, can call the data service for them whenever it wants and then the data service, once it has it in memory, it can update it. 
need be based on any kind of like caching or updating logic that might be in there. Um, so to give you an idea what this kind of looks like in code, um, there's the matches data service. And you'll see up at top we have, um, what, what this is going to return is a collection of possible matches for a user. So if, I, if, if I'm a player and um, I'm online and I want to play Call of Duty, uh, the system calls out to our API and finds a list of matches for people who also want to play Call of Duty and people who um, might be interested in playing with me. Um, and it returns that um, as a JSON object. Um, however, we're not allowed to store any Xbox profile information on our servers. So once we get this onto the client, we then need to call back out to um, Xbox Live and get like their gamer pick, their gamer score, and all that information, and then mash it all together and update the backbone collection as we go, right? So that's where this lazy loading stuff comes in. Um, and that's where using promises is really nice. So we return a promise from this, from this API. When that promise resolves, it resolves to a backbone collection, and that's those backbone collections floating around freely in space. And the UI can use that. Um, we'll see uh, a UI component a little bit later and, and why that's important. Um, but basically, this gives us caching. So since we wrapped around those two, those two underscore variables at the top, which are initial, initialized to null, um, since we store our collection and our promise there, we can come back and get those out of memory anytime. So anyone who needs to call this API in the future is going to get data immediately. Um, and when the app is initializing, they're going to get it um, a little bit more slowly. But since we're returning a promise, it really doesn't matter. Um, all right, so here's what it looks like to activate a UI component. Um, when we use promises and we call this activation method at the top, we get a lot of then. All right, we get um, string together a bunch of methods and basically build the UI. Now, again, we, as you're looking down through this, what looks like, now that I'm looking at kind of messy code, but uh, yeah, like I said, not elegant. But um, it kind of makes sense. As you're going down through it, you, you build the UI, and it doesn't matter if the collection has already been loaded or whether it's been there all along. Right, so if we, if we look at one of those topic detail pages and then we come back, we want to have our matches ready to go. And because we have a promise, they are. We just go promise dot then and then instantiate this component again right from the beginning. And we know it came from cache. Um, or the data service knows that it came from cache, but this component really doesn't care. It doesn't care if it came from the cache or what. And if we update any of these models, um, we don't sync them back. The data service does. The data service detects the update. It syncs them back up. It knows what to do. It knows whether to, whether to call Xbox Live. It knows whether to call our service. It knows whether to call the CMS, um, so on and so forth. Um, and then lastly, or almost lastly, um, when you're doing uh, events, um, we have the, the event API makes it really easy to decouple an application, um, like that, that event bus that I've been talking about, the one that Marionette has. Um, that is, like, decoupling is really great. We've heard that several times already today, and uh, I think anyone wouldn't say that's a good idea. However, you can go too far with it, especially with an event-based system, in that when you're looking through the code and reading through the code and you have, you have a, you're a sizable application, and you're like, where did, where did this thing hear about this thing? And how does it call back to this thing? And like, what method did it call? Because it's not a method. It just fired an event, right? So we found it a lot easier to put all those in one place. Um, and that's what this is. This file is actually much, much longer than what I have on this slide. Um, but it's a lot easier to go like, OK, so if I need to know where to call for this particular thing, like I know what file to go to to look through and find like where the API is. Um, and if I need to look at the implementation, that's there too. I should never have to do that, but if you do, it's there. Uh, so I guess the lesson really is um, that customers do buy products and not code. And sometimes when we innovate, um, it can be messy. And uh, my wife always says when she's baking and I come home and the kitchen is a disaster, she's like, I know, I know, it looks awful, but it gets better. <laughs> Um, but I, I think that's what happens with when people build anything, um, particularly with software. Um, 
and we should be happy in the end product um, and make, make, make our code as maintainable as possible. Um, and no matter what, we'll, we'll get there. So uh, even if it starts out messy. Um, there is a lot more things we'd like to do. Um, there's, uh, we'd like to move the Ajax request into a background thread. Um, one interesting thing about this gaming console is that we discovered that if you make an Ajax request while there's an animation happening, and the animations are long, they're like six or 700 milliseconds. If you make an Ajax request during that time, the animation freezes up. This is a gaming console. This thing is supposed to do graphics. <laughs> but um, yeah, so that, that was kind of annoying. So we're going to move our Ajax request into a background thread. We'd like to do a lot more with the lazy loading. Um, and uh, the talk we saw earlier today from Dan uh, was really inspiring for that. So um, thanks, Dan, there. We're going to keep on working on that. We would also like to cache more information on the local disk. Um, the Xbox has a pretty good API for doing that. Um, so we'd like to take advantage of that. Um, but it's opening a whole can of worms. <laughs> and, um, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to be fun. Um, and we're looking forward to it. That's it. Thank you very much.